I think this is going to be a most interesting panel, and I suspect that several of you think so as well. Uh, I want to start, you know the title of it, of course, is What to Do About Iran, and I'll introduce the speakers, but first I want to give special thanks to the Brazilian ambassador. Uh, those of you who were here at the last panel heard Barbara Slavin ask him all kinds of detailed questions about the Brazilian-Turkish-Iranian agreement. And I thought to myself, oh boy, there goes my panel. But then I realized he's an ambassador. And of course he said, and I quote, I can't say more than what's in the paper. <laughs> so uh, our panel is still viable. Uh, and we have uh, quite a group of people here. Uh, let me begin, but we're going to do this in alphabetical order, so I'll begin with David Kay. In fact, I have two people on my panel who have both resigned out of principle, uh, and that's an L-E, not an A-L, which is remarkable in this town. Uh, as David writes in his bio, uh, President Bush directed in 2003 that the hunt for Iraqi weapons of mass destruction be transferred from DOD to the CIA, and that the director of the CIA, uh, and the director of the CIA appointed Dr. David Kay to lead that search. And then he goes on to say, having concluded there had been no stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq at the time of the war, Dr. Kay reported that conclusion and resigned his position. Uh, David now is a senior fellow at the Potomac Institute. He was the UNSCOM uh, chief uh, nuclear weapons inspector. He was in the papers all the time, especially when Saddam locked him up for four days as a hostage. It was, it was four days, right, David? Yeah. Must have been long days. Uh, he's testified before Congress on uh, innumerable occasions. He's written articles all over the place. Uh, anybody who follows this part of the world and hasn't heard of David Kay ha doesn't follow this part of the world. Uh, moving over to our next speaker, Jeffrey Kemp on my right. Uh, actually, there aren't too many people on my right, but Jeffrey's sitting on my right. Uh, he has just written a book called The East Moves West, India, China, and Asia's Growing Presence in the Middle East, published by Brookings, even though he's with the Nixon Center. Uh, Jeffrey has been involved in this part of the world for, I guess, about 35 years, give or take, maybe a little more than that, served in the DOD in the 70s, uh, in the PA and E office, uh, worked for the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, wrote, was then a widely publicized report on U.S. military sales to Iran. It's still selling in Tehran. Uh, he's been a tenured faculty member at the Fletcher School since the 70s. Again, somebody who writes and speaks frequently, appears on TV frequently in, in, uh, uh, on Middle Eastern issues. And then to my left is Flint Leverett, another one who left the administration, and I'm quoting here, this is from his own bio, he left the Bush administration and government service in the spring of 2003 because of disagreements about Middle East policy and the conduct of the war on terror more generally. Uh, when he wasn't leaving the administration or the government, uh, he had a distinguished career uh, in uh, the National Security Council, uh, on the uh, policy planning staff at State, senior analyst at CIA, again, somebody with loads and loads of publications, currently a senior fellow and director of Geopolitics of Energy Initiative of the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation. And finally, Richard Pearl, who has written such a long bio that I can read it all. Richard Pearl served as Chairman of the Defense Policy Board, Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Policy, and a staff member to Senator Henry Jackson, Democrat of Washington. Mr. Pearl is co-author of An End to Evil and the author of Hardline, a political novel. He co-directed AI's Commission on Future Defenses. End of Richard Pearl's bio. Um, I think he's done a little more than that. I think uh, most of you know that. And I actually haven't mentioned that to Richard, but he knows it, of course, because yesterday he goes up to uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Sergei Ivanov, and he says, I'm Richard Pearl, and the Deputy Prime Minister of Russia says, yes, I've heard of you and I've wanted to meet you. Now, nobody ever tells me that. Um, and, of course, Richard Pearl has been at the center of international security policy, that was actually his title at DOD, but at the center of America's international security policy for uh, probably, again, the last 35 or so years, uh, and still is. Um, 
I'd like to just raise a few issues for the panel, and then we're going to go in, in alphabetical order. I hope the panel is going to address some of the following. Uh, first, uh, maybe they can give a better answer than the Ambassador Vieira did. What does this Brazil-Turkey-Iran agreement mean for the prospects of sanctions? And secondly, uh, we heard from Dmitry Symes in the previous panel that uh, at least one senior Russian official didn't uh, give much to the report that there was a Russian-Chinese agreement on sanctions. Well, again, what do you all think of that agreement? And more generally, what do you think of sanctions? Will they work? What kind of sanctions might work? Um, and if not, what do we do? And do we have the money to do it? Uh, one side issue, but it's not really, is can we restrain the Israelis from doing something we don't want them to do? And last, uh, if Iran does become nuclear, how do we live with it? What do we do about it? Just some food for thought. I will open with uh, the first of my two panelists who left the administration. Thank David. you very much, Doug. Uh, when I got the invitation for this panel, my reaction was, can I find my body armor still? Uh, you've got a group of people who hold very different views on, on this issue, so it should be an interesting discussion. I thought I'd start by, let me sketch out what I think the next 12 months to 24 months hold in this relationship, and anyone who tries to go beyond that uh, certainly has a better crystal ball than I have. I think the current regime in Iran is unlikely to be overthrown in the next year or two, but neither will the opposition disappear. So that's just going to be a pet petrol source that anyone who tries to deal with Iran in any sense is going to have to recognize. Um, in the near term, I think the U.S. The strategy, if you can dignify what we do with a strategy vis-a-vis -vis Iran's nuclear program, is to offer, or at least seem to offer, diplomatic engagement while threatening increasing levels of sanctions in order to slow, and I guess some in the administration would say even reverse Iran's program. My personal view is this policy is very unlikely to succeed. Um, at best, at at the end of two years, Iran's nuclear weapon status will be ambiguous. At worst, the evidence, overwhelming evidence, will be that it's made so much clear and measurable progress towards a nuclear weapons capability that uh, even politicians will have a hard time not acknowledging that. Uh, I do not think uh, that the U.S. nor Israel, certainly in 2010, I would say even 2011, is unlikely to take military action against that program. My, my only basis for evidence on that perhaps is that John Bolton, who has been assuring everyone that er Israel would, uh, most recently in his Wall Street editorial says, well, we've got to learn to answer the hard question of how do you live with a nuclear armed Iraq if Israel won't do it. I think the end can go into this if anyone has questions. I think clear balance of, of advantage and disadvantage is understood in Israel as well as in senior levels in Washington. That military action just has too many first and even and second, third order consequences to undertake it. Given that, I think the Iranian position is, and I think we've seen it this week, is to continue to develop diplomatic strategic and economic options to mitigate the effects of any U.S.-led effort to get sanctions. And let me say, I hope you listen to what Ambassador Vieira said. It was not just read about it in the newspaper. It was a very subtle and diplomatic statement that said, look, the old U.N. institutions of the Security Council led by the, the Perm Five uh, and five plus one with Germany having essentially been annexed to the Perm Five is no longer seen as adequate by many members of the Security Council in the UN. Any U.S. administration is going to have to come to terms with that. I thought, thought today if you go online and read Secretary Clinton's testimony. Secretary Clinton was up before the Foreign, Senate Foreign Relations Committee and she opened her statement by saying, 
We have achieved agreement with the Russians and the Chinese on a sanction a tough sanction resolution, and that is our answer to the agreement with, between the Turks, the Brazilians, and the Iranians. That is an attitude that is designed to have what I would call an impact to the previous regime. Uh, that, that could have come out of the George Bush White House as opposed to the Obama White House as it's a front and seen as a front. The other thing the Bra Brazilians and the Turks said uh, when they signed this agreement, which is also online worth reading, and in many ways it is the problem for the United States and the others who are trying to halt the Iranian program where it is, is that Iran has a clear treaty-based right to have a full cycle, nuclear fuel cycle program, including enrichment. Now, that ignores the history of the previous Security Council resolutions and the, and the Iranian failure to satisfy either the IAEA or the Security Council with regard to each of those steps. But that also reflects a strong belief in the world of, of the non permanent members of the Security Council, that the Security Council is trying to close off alternatives and technologies that they have a right to. This happens to be occurring during the same month that the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference is going on in New York. So if you want to flavor the month of that, listen to the Egyptians and others making the exact same argument. So I think... Uh, in terms of the agreement, let me say, Barbara asked a question, it was a good one. Uh, what do you see happening here, et cetera, et cetera? What if the Iranians don't send the required letter? They're required to send a letter to the IAEA uh, within seven days that after the signature of the agreement with the Turks and the Brazilians that would say, we're prepared to accept a fuel swap under these arrangements that were outlined in the initial agreement. I mean, the Iranians would be absolutely crazy not to send the letter in seven days the negotiations that will go on forever take place after those seven days. If they were to, to breach the agreement before it even got to step one, I think the White House would be very, very happy for that to occur, and that's not going to occur. But you've got an agreement which, on its face, looks like it's very similar to what the U.S. had on offer. Now, the U.S. had it on offer at a very different point in the uranium fuel cycle. Uh, let me just hit a few of the problems with the agreement. The agreement requires that roughly half of the current stock of low enriched uranium be deposited in Turkey until some period in which uh, fuel rods for the medical, the Tehran reactor, are delivered. Now, it, when the agreement was originally proposed, this arrangement originally proposed by the United States, that would have been all the low enriched uranium. Yes, three minutes, I'll get it in. Uh, <laughs> that was all. Now they've got twice as much. So essentially they have enough low enriched uranium already that will remain in Iran that if it, they wanted to be so foolish, they could get one bomb's worth out of it. The more troubling part is the Iranians are ha in the agreement will be allowed to continue enrichment at 20% as opposed to 3 to 4%, which you use in a peaceful reactor. 20% is what the medical reactor uses. And the Iranian justification is, well, if, if the US, French, and the Russians renege at some point, we will at least be able to go ahead with refueling our own reactor. The problem is that 20% is a level that to go up to 90% is trivial at that point. So it allows the Iranians to continue their activity. The other more key and troubling point of the agreement is that it asserts that the Iranians can be, the Iranian compliance can be assured by continued international agency IAEA inspection of Iran. The problem is there's virtually no one who's ever been involved in inspection that believes that inspectors will ever have the intrusiveness that we had in Iraq in 91 or, or after 2003 that finds out what's going on in that country. The level of intrusiveness, this is a country that for over 20 years has cheated on its non-proliferation obligations, who has clandestine facilities that only come to light after they are discovered, 
and that they then assert they have every right to keep them clandestine because they've not yet operationalized them. It is the time that we start to acknowledge that we're at the day after. And the real policy question is the one that Dove started to ask, what if sanctions fail, what do we do? And I think that is where attention needs to be focused. Um, there are no easy answers, and some of the historic answers are probably misleading. As in the first panel this morning that was said, watch transferring the lessons of Vietnam to Afghanistan. Uh, watch transferring the lessons of Cold War deterrence uh, and containment to the situation of Iran. There probably are some lessons you can learn with transferring. There's some that you shouldn't. I remember one of the most telling criticisms George Kennan had of containment, of which he was the intellectual father of, was that he said he never intended that it be military containment. The danger I see of easily going to a containment policy against Iran that involves militarily surrounding Iran is that's unlikely to have the impact, that, uh, the result that anyone wants to. A, a smarter containment policy, I will stop because we don't have time to go into it, would involve, and this is worth rereading Kennan for, is creating an economic, social, and institutional neighborhood in which Iran not, o not only would feel constrained, but more importantly would feel it's in their interest to join and that they have to live by those rules to join. So I think as you think what, and I wish there were people, more people thinking about the issue of the day after, because I think we're at the point of the day after, and we've got to think that through. Well, thank you, David. Jeffrey. <clears throat> well, thank you, Dov. I'm, I'm not going to try to kibbutz on the nuclear issue, since David's the specialist on this, and I'm certain Flint and Richard will have some things to say. What I wanted to do was to address very specifically the question what to do about Iran, but in the context of the last point that David made, namely, I mean, Iran is in a region, and, and how Iran evolves and how the region evolves is going to, uh, in large part, determine what flexibility and options the United States has. Now, you know, there are, we could talk about you know, the direct engagement of the United States with Iran, engagement that the uh, Obama administration wanted that was torpedoed by the disastrous election behavior of the government of Iran in the last year. Um, sanctions, I don't hold out much for sanctions, but I do think they are useful in a limited sense. Um, and, and as for confrontation, I, uh, military confrontation, I think that's all less said about that, the better in my judgment. Um, Iran is a dangerous country, and it's an important country, and it's a country that has aspirations, some of them I think perfectly justified, others of them perhaps a little pretentious. Um, but it is not, it, it, it's not a, super, a regional superpower, it is not a, a, a sort of a hegemon that is going to uh, overrun and dominate the neighborhood, because the neighborhood itself contains some very powerful opposing players. And I just want to say a few words about the neighbors because if our policy towards the neighborhood is more constructive and imaginative uh, in, the, in the coming years, that will go a long way, it seems to me, to put limitations on Iranian capabilities uh, whether or not they have a nuclear weapon or whether they uh, decide to have a Japanese type option where we don't know whether they have a capability. Um, let me say a few words about several very important neighbors who directly influence what's going on in Iran. Iraq, Turkey, uh, the Arab Gulf states, AFPAC, Afghanistan and Pakistan, um, and increasingly, increasingly some of the major Asian powers. Now, we discussed this morning the war in Iraq and where it's leading to, and whether or not the elections will result in a stable government. And I don't want to repeat all that. I just want to sort of to think through, though, that having invested so much blood and treasure in Iraq, it really is 
in our interests, no matter what opinions we had about why, the, why we went in, it really is in our interests uh, to, to, to try to make sure that Iraq works. Uh, works in a way that serves some of our interests. We had a talk the other day by um, uh, Kubad Talabani at the Nixon Center, who, who sort of stressed that, you know, what everyone hopes to see emerge is, is a relatively democratic Iraq, a relatively stable Iraq, relatively um, secular and prosperous Iraq. Now, um, that, if it happens over the coming years, it is of extraordinary importance because you know Iraq has a great potential to uh, once more be a major player in the region and if indeed the the numbers about potential Iraqi oil production are anything to be believed with you know some are saying they could go up to 5 to 6 million barrels a day even more over the coming 4 or 5 years that will have a profound influence on Iran and I think the idea that the Iranians are going to treat Iraq as a sort of a, 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 a satellite and be able to manipulate the Iraqis, I think, is wildly overestimates uh, their capabilities. Turkey, critical country in this this deal with Brazil, but irrespective of the nuclear side of it, Turkey is a really important emerging power now in the Middle East. Its relations with Israel, Syria, um, I Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan are all very important to our interests. And, uh, you know, we have to accept the fact that, as Rick uh, Burt said, sitting right here just before the break, um, I mean, Turkey is turning away, it would seem, from the European Union and reasserting what some would call a sort of neo-Ottomism um, in, in the region. Turkey has excellent relations with Iraq at this point in time. Um, Turkey has good relations with Iran. Turkey is a player, and it, it is not self-evident that Turkey is, uh, like um, Iraq, going to be beholden to what the Iranians want to do, quite to the contrary. I mean, I think you can make the case that Turkey is potentially a, a stronger power, um, certainly economically, and can play a very assertive, and I think, um, collaborative role uh, with us if we play our cards right. Same thing's true for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Iran has huge interests in Afghanistan um, and, and shares some of our, um, our interests as well. Remember it was the Iranians uh, um, and the United States who put together the provisional government in I Afghanistan in December 2001. But I think we all know that one of the reasons we're in Afghanistan, and again this was discussed this morning, is because of the strategic importance of Pakistan. And if, just like Iraq, if, if Pakistan emerges from its current turmoil um, as a uh, stronger, uh, more stable, uh, a democratic country, you're talking about 170 million people, more than in Russia, uh, in a fully-fledged nuclear force. Uh, there have been all sorts of hopes that there will be a rapprochement with India at some point in the future, if only for economic uh, self-preservation. Then, it seems to me, Pakistan becomes a very important blocky, block of any Iranian sort of expansion uh, to the east. We have the Gulf Arabs. Look, the Gulf Arabs have enormous amounts of money. They are spending a fortune on weaponry. If you compare the inventories of the Arab Gulf states in terms of advanced weaponry with that of Iran, it's pitiful. Now, whether they could ever get their act together, uh, whether this would translate into real power, who knows? But if I were an Iranian uh, looking across the Gulf at what the Saudis and the UAE are putting into their inventories, I'd, I'd certainly uh, take a second look at my own policies. Um, as Iran uses its, uh, its muscles, uh, I think the Arab Gulf countries will draw closer to us. Uh, 
They also have very close ties with India, China, Japan, and Korea. This idea that somehow, you know, the Chinese are going to uh, uh, do a deal with Iran um, ignores the fact that China has massive investments in Saudi Arabia, um, and, and as again was pointed out uh, by Rick, uh, in, increasing interest in Iraq. So it's 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 not that the Iranians are there, uh, the only one that is 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 looking for. A Asia to counterbalance us. And let's not ignore the fact, you mentioned, uh, let's not uh, dismiss the fact, you mentioned uh, Israel, Dov. Well, you know, it's often put in terms of the existential threat to Israel that an Iranian nuclear weapon poses. Well, that's true, okay? But let's just face it, Israel is a major nuclear power. Um, and, and, and no country, um, even one run by mullahs, can ignore that reality. Uh, nor can they ignore the reality that if they do go nuclear, and this is one of the real concerns, it seems to be, in the region, um, Egypt might be uh, in a position where it too then has to reconsider its, its nuclear options. And none of this, it seems to me, adds up to a very uh, pretty picture for the Iranians. So I guess my conclusion, Dav, is that um, Yes, I know there's a hell of a lot can go wrong, and we should focus on this nuclear issue right now, and uh, whether the, 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 the UN uh, 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 vote on sanctions is going to be strong or weak, who knows. But the reality is, unless we look at this in the context of the regional developments and the fact that there are other major players out there as well as us, I think we're going to miss the big picture. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. All right, Flint. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, let me start by um, trying to address the two questions that Dov laid out, and then I'll offer um, a few remarks about where I think U.S. policy toward Iran should go. Um, one of the questions that Dov posed is, what is the impact of the Brazil-Turkey nuclear deal on the prospects for for sanctions. And I think my bottom line is um, it's made uh, getting a Security Council consensus on sanctions um, much more difficult than it already was. And I think if the United States um, continues to respond to the Brazil-Turkey deal as carelessly as Secretary Clinton has been responding to it um, over the last 24 hours. Uh, I think the difficulties facing the U.S. and the Security Council will, will only grow. Um, I think this is a really significant development. Here you have two rising economic powers exerting very decisive political influence on a high-profile issue of international peace and security. And they did so in a way that politely, but I think pretty clearly, signaled to the United States that rising powers aren't going to accept the United States unilaterally defining the terms for managing such issues. I think David Kay's description of the clash between the U.S. perspective on Iranian enrichment and the Brazil-Turkey perspective on Iranian um, enrichment is, a, is, is accurate. Um, from a Brazilian perspective, as I understand it, you know, Brazil is a country which gave up its own nuclear weapons program uh, to the satisfaction of the international community but continues to insist on its right, um, its sovereign right and its right as a signatory to the NPT to uh, fuel cycle activities. And I think it's understandable that Brazil would be very uncomfortable with an effort by the United States unilaterally or even in conjunction with other P5 states to, um, in a sense, unilaterally define um, the rules of the road for enrichment by non-weapon states. For Turkey, uh, governed by a democratically elected and quite popular Islamist party, I think the idea that Iran's nuclear program is going to be treated differently uh, by the international community because the Islamic Republic is governed by Islamists is also unacceptable. So it doesn't surprise me at all that these two countries would, would push back and put as the first point 
in this agreement that was brokered in Tehran um, a clear statement that Iran has the right to, um, to enrich uranium. I think that the United States has diplomatically mishandled the issue of refueling the Tehran research reactor. When this issue originally came up, it was um, basically a straightforward technical proposition. Iran requested IAEA assistance in refueling a reactor in a thoroughly safeguarded facility in the middle of Tehran. Um, I walked past it the last time I was at the University of Tehran. Um, I requested international assistance to refuel this reactor that produces medical isotopes. And because the Obama administration couldn't make up its own mind about how to deal in the long term with the enrichment issue, the Obama administration turned what should have been a straightforward technical proposition into a highly politicized effort to get most of Iran's then stockpile of low enriched uranium out of the country. Iran said it was prepared to accept a swap in principle but wanted to negotiate details. Uh, the Obama administration has been insisting since October that the so-called Bardai proposal was a take it or leave it proposition even though Bardai has said publicly it shouldn't be treated as a take it or leave it proposition. Now, you know, that's basically a formula for making yourself diplomatically irrelevant. And I think it's in that vacuum that Brazil and Turkey stepped in. Um, on enrichment, I mean, the reality is Iran is enriching uranium. I think the prospects of Iran stopping enrichment, um, you know, are about equal to mine of winning the lottery. And, you know, we ought to face reality and we ought to stop going on this quixotic quest to stop Iranian enrichment and we ought to instead be engaging in serious negotiations about the uh, monitoring verification arrangements that would be in place to make sure that those enrichment activities don't produce fissile grade um, material for uh, for nuclear weapons, but that's a you know that is a, a shift toward reality that the Obama administration has yet to make. I think if they uh, if the Obama administration you know basically refuses to work with this. Um, refuses to try and reach some sort of accommodation with the Brazilian-Turkish deal. Um, you know, China, Russia may have signed up for a heavily watered down sanctions resolution in terms of language. I don't think they're going to be rushing. Of some significant change from current policies, they will become a nuclear weapon state. Secondly, uh, uh, I doubt that uh, diplomacy um, will lead Iran to abandon its nuclear ambitions. Uh, and that's the only objective worth defining uh, through the diplomatic process. Uh, a great deal can be done uh, in the way of uh, discussions, even agreements that fall short of achieving the purpose. But the purpose must be the abandonment of a weapons program and I don't believe that's going to be achieved. Uh, through diplomatic means. Um, third, Iran, it seems to me, has outmaneuvered the U United States and those of uh, our friends who share our misgivings about the consequences of Iran becoming a nuclear weapon state. Um, and I believe this agreement, uh, uh, together with the Turks, um, and the Brazilians is yet another uh, skillful maneuver by the Iranians that in no way suggests uh, Iran is interested in slowing or altering its course, which is aimed at acquiring nuclear weapons. Fourth, it seems to me that uh, sanctions that are conceivable won't work, and sanctions uh, that, uh, that might work uh, are not conceivable, with one exception, and I'll come to that exception at the end. So the effort to cobble together sanctions that will be uh, inadequate to the task seems to me uh, to play right into Iranian hands, because during the time that sanctions are discussed and even uh, if achieved, implemented um, without decisive effect, work uh, on Iran's nuclear 
um, weapons program continues. Um, next, and I think others would agree with this, uh, if Iran becomes a nuclear weapons state, other states will be uh, uh, encouraged, and I think decisively encouraged, to acquire nuclear weapons of their own, and the world will face the prospect of, uh, um, to borrow uh, a, a title of an essay many, written many years ago by Albert Wolstetter, will be faced with the prospect of uh, living life in a nuclear armed crowd. Uh, and a nuclear armed crowd that includes some obviously unstable uh, governments and regimes. Next, it seems to me that uh, um, Israel rightly regards an Iranian nuclear weapon uh, as an existential threat. Um, whether I Iran would actually use a nuclear weapon or permit one to be transferred to uh, an organization that might, uh, they have a history of transferring weapons to organizations that use them against uh, against Israel. Whether they would do that or not, uh, I, I don't know. It's impossible to, uh, um, to predict. But I do believe that uh, what is uh, objectionable in Iranian behavior today, which is a pernicious role in the Middle East, uh, and uh, certainly one that menaces uh, Israel and potentially other countries with which the United States has important relationships, uh, that activity would not only continue, but it seems to me it would almost certainly be increased. Uh, confident behind a nuclear shield, uh, one can only imagine uh, what the leadership in Tehran would contemplate. We see what they do when they're not so, so protected. Next, all of this is taking place uh, with a regime that may be among the most unpopular regimes in the world. Um, Flint Leverett will doubtless disagree with this. He's, um, he's expressed uh, the extraordinary view that, uh, that a majority of uh, Iranians are happy with the government they now have, that they want to, they're eager to retain the uh, uh, Islamic uh, Republic uh, uh, of Iran, that the last elections were, uh, were uh, free and fair, none of which I believe. Uh, and if one wants to gauge the popularity of the uh, Iranian regime, you need only look at uh, uh, the means that the regime has been uh, forced to resort to to maintain order. Uh, when you turn out tens of thousands, indeed hundreds of thousands, of um, uh, re revolutionary guards and basiji, thugs of all descriptions. That is a regime that is not popular. You do not see that kind of police activity in popular regimes. Um, the, uh, I, I won't go in any detail into uh, the horrors of this regime. The systematic use of rape in prisons uh, uh, to intimidate the families of women who were taken into prison even though uh, they have not committed any crime at all. Uh, the executions, the silencing of the press, it's well known. It's a, a regime that uh, I find almost impossible to, uh, to defend, to imagine a defense for. Um, but uh, Flint is more imaginative than I, and he is in the past sought to defend this regime, and I don't know, maybe he'll do it uh, uh, today. Flint uh, invokes the China precedent, uh, Nixon in China, and this seems to me uh, highly uh, misleading. What was significant about uh, uh, Nixon's opening to China was the essential triangular relationship. Uh, that led the Chinese to believe it was in their interest to cooperate with the United States. Um, I keep looking for evidence that Iran believes it's in Iran's interest to cooperate with the United States, and I can't find it. Um, Iran is not threatened in the way China believed it was threatened by the Soviet Union. So the political circumstances are entirely different. 
And in any case, the United States gave China very little except diplomatic recognition, which Iran, of course, already has. Uh, I'm not an expert on, uh, on, on the history of uh, efforts to engage the Iranians and achieve uh, uh, constructive agreements. But my friend and uh, colleague Michael Ledeen is, and on a previous occasion, um, rather similar to this one in a discussion with uh, Flint Leverett, he adduced a rather long list of, uh, of uh, discussions, in some cases agreements that were promised but never materialized because the promises turned out to be false. Um, and uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, that event took place at the Atlantic Council and it is a, a very interesting exchange of views on the history of American uh, dialogue with Iran, which has been more or less continuous uh, from the earliest days uh, of the Ir Iranian Revolution. So I'm rather uh, skeptical about uh, uh, the China precedent, and I certainly uh, question uh, Flint's, I think, underlying premise when he says that for the United States to achieve its objectives in the Middle East, we must achieve a rapprochement with the Islamic uh, Republic. Um, is that because the Islamic Republic will deliberately and mischievously uh, make uh, uh, trouble with respect to all of our objectives unless we achieve a rapprochement? What price are we going to pay for that rapprochement? Um, it could turn out to be a higher price than uh, the, the problems we have to contend with if Iran continues to be mischievous. And I don't think there's much doubt that it is, in fact, mischievous is um, not quite the right word. It's worse than that. So I, I have grave doubts that uh, we can sit down with the Iranians and transform them from our opponents to our uh, strategic partners or collaborators. I believe them when, uh, when they uh, describe us as, uh, as they do, and not as a potential uh, partner, but in the most draconian terms. We are a, uh, a threat to everything that uh, the present leadership in Iran hopes to achieve. Uh, its religious objectives, uh, for example, its millenarian view, uh, we represent the opposition, and I don't believe the circumstances are going to um, permit the kind of agreement Flint has in mind. The Chinese, by the way, for all their differences, were uh, immensely practical. You did not find um, um, Zhou Enlai or Deng Xiaoping or even Mao expressing the kind of uh, fanatical millenarian view that we hear routinely from uh, Ahmadinejad. So the, the prospects are dim, and the analogy is, uh, it seems to me, quite wrong. Where does that leave us? There are two things that I think we can do. Um, neither one uh, is a, a route to guaranteed success, of course. One is we can uh, uh, assist those Iranians who want to change their regime. Now, I, I can't tell you that they will succeed. Uh, I think they will, even without us, in time. But as of now, they get no help from us. None. Not even significant moral support. And it's damn difficult under those circumstances when people are uh, uh, subjected to the brutality of the regime uh, to, to organize an effective resistance. And they've done remarkably well, considering. Uh, so we could be helping them, and we should be helping them. We should be helping them openly, defiantly, if you will. And if you have doubts about whether that concerns them, just listen to what they say. Uh, they're concerned. They're plenty concerned. And uh, uh, there are people we can work with in Iran, outside of Iran, uh, who uh, have the potential, I believe, to change that regime. Might not work. Lastly, on the question of sanctions, I agree that uh, sanctions generally don't work. Often they, uh, they further empower 
the very people you're trying to influence. So I would not attempt sanctions intended to change the minds of the leadership in Iran. I don't think that will work. But there are some sanctions uh, that could conceivably uh, become embedded in a strategy to change the regime. And one of those has been widely discussed and uh, has very significant support uh, uh, in Congress. I think that must be what Flint had in mind when he made a derisive reference to the Congress. And that would be uh, a, uh, an effort to uh, restrict, insofar as we can, not completely of course, the flow of refined petroleum product uh, that fills the uh, gasoline tanks. Uh, civilian and military, and uh, which Iran must import from outside because they can't produce enough. And if, uh, if we could accomplish uh, a significant measure of that, and if uh, we were to have the good fortune of an accident or two at one of the four refineries in, in Iran, not inconceivable accident, we've had them here. Uh, that could produce a really dramatic shock, and uh, very possibly a shock that would help bring down the regime. There comes a certain point when the regime is loathed and despised, when action against it does not cause people to rally to the regime, but causes them further to condemn the people who have put them in that situation. And I think we may be near that uh, tipping point in Iran, and if people can't fuel their automobiles, uh, that might uh, bring it a little bit closer. So I would hope we would give some serious consideration to those measures and least of all cave in and accept that it is inevitable that we must live with an Iran that behaves as Iran behaves across the board and that has nuclear weapons on top of it. Well, thank you very much. Um, seeing as you're all in such agreement, <laughs> Um, my thought is that uh, I'll give, uh, in the course of questions, members of the panel the uh, chance to make some comments with reference to what other members of the panel said. I'd point out to you two things before uh, I throw it out for questioning. One is, there seems to be agreement across the table that uh, current policy is not working. Now, the solutions are different. Clearly, but no one I heard rally to the uh, current policy, to support of the current policy. The other point I think uh, is important in light of the discussion we had in the previous panel about globalization. The argument's been made that because of globalization, countries are getting less nationalistic. And I certainly didn't hear that in this panel. Uh, whether you talk about Iran itself, neo Ottomanism, which doesn't sound globalized to me unless it's under Turkey. Uh, references we've heard to neo-Zarist policy, which isn't terribly globalized. Iraq, Egypt, Brazil, China. Uh, none of these countries seem to be uh, any less nationalistic uh, now than they were a decade or a hundred years ago, frankly. So we need to distinguish to some degree between economic globalization on the one hand and uh, political nationalism which in Eastern, what was Eastern Europe, certainly in the region we're discussing today in East Asia as well, uh, doesn't seem to be getting any weaker. Uh, quite the contrary actually. Uh, just when uh, I call on you, please let us all know who, me, who you are and to whom you wish to address your question and uh, as I say we'll give the panelists a chance to work in some other answers to the questions. You had your hand up first there, and then Barbara had it second, and then Fritz had it third, so. Esteem, not fear, uh, Sunni radicalism. You know, we hear these reports, and, and they're sort of buried in the news about, you know, bombings in Isfahan, uh, you know, that uh, rebel activity in Baluchistan uh, by, you know, Sunnis, and that the Iranian government always, of course, blames, you know, America, Britain, Israel, because they don't seem to dare blame uh, these things on, on their fellow Muslims. Uh, 
if it's not now uh, you know, a real threat to Iran, is the rise of Sunni radicalism uh, in, uh, among Iran's you know, oppressed Sunnis, is this a possibility that the Iranians might fear that could potentially, we could have a rapprochement on this common fear, because you know, Al-Qaeda, you know, they, they hate everyone. They hate us, they hate the Israelis, and they hate the Shias, and they're not shy about saying it. Thank you. Flint, why don't you go first? Okay. Yeah, I, I think that um, the rise of, of Sunni extremism is epitomized by Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, um, Sunni extremist groups, Salafi groups that have emerged um, in Iran itself. I, I think it's a major security concern um, for, for the Islamic Republic. Um, I don't think it is the preeminent security concern for the Islamic Republic and while in many points in the past they have cooperated with the United States in dealing with various manifestations of, of Sunni extremism. Um, that cooperation is always managed and, um, and, and, and carried out with an eye to this larger relationship with the United States. I wouldn't say it kind of stands on its own as this um, preeminent strategic concern, but it is certainly a very important concern and I think it would be an area that is ripe for U.S.-Iranian um, US -Iranian collaboration. Let me just, I, I wanted to take up the premise of your, of your question about how that, and it gets to, to something that, that Mr. Pearl said about that there's this kind of triangulation element with U.S.-China rapprochement that's not present in the U.S.-Iranian case. I actually think that's the wrong way to look at U.S.-China rapprochement. I mean, if, if all U.S.-China rapprochement was about was dealing with the Soviet Union, why did the U.S.-China relationship become more important in the Cold War, not less important? What the U.S.-China opening was fundamentally about was that both countries had some very important strategic and other problems that they could not deal with, or at least could not deal with in an optimal way without better relations with one another. I would say that is very, very much true for the Islamic Republic in the United States today. Both sides have important security and strategic problems that they can only deal with, or at least only optimally deal with, um, in an atmosphere of improved bilateral okay. relations. And I think that's the real Terrible. parallel to draw. Thanks. Richard? Well, I, th I think we just differ on the history, but there are people here, uh, Marvin Kalb, Richard Solomon, who know a lot about this uh, subject. My recollection um, is that uh, the, the interest in countering the Soviet Union so completely swamped all other concerns that uh, for all practical purposes, that's what the rapprochement was about. It wasn't about two countries getting together to solve uh, other problems. It had to do entirely with uh, um, Chinese fear, which was real cold fear about the, uh, about the Soviet Union and uh, about our desire to balance the Soviet Union by uh, driving the wedge between uh, the Soviet Union and China uh, further. And it came about when, uh, um, when some people, Richard Nixon, my old boss, Scoop Jackson, began to notice that uh, the communist world was not uh, monolithic and there were deep uh, historical uh, uh, antagonisms between the Soviet Union and China, which persist, by the way, to this day. And uh, they, they get papered over from time to time, but uh, if, you, if you scratch a, a Russian, he's worried about China. The Chinese less worried about Russia now. Jeff? I, just a footnote on this comparison. I mean, the other point I would make is that one of the, the reasons that the Nixon to China 
uh, overture worked was because Richard Nixon was the Republican president. I mean, and coming from a party that had been the most strongly opposed to any normalizations with China. Now, the, for today, Obama to offer rapprochement with Iran, I, I mean, it, it's not going to happen. I mean, the, the entire Republican Party and most of his own party would turn against him if you try to calculate the opinion on Iran on Capitol Hill. So, it, you know, I may be unrealistic about some of my hopes, but Flint, <laughs> we, we have to wait. We have to wait for a. We have to wait for a, a Richard Nixon for this to happen. It's not going to happen soon. We only have we only have his center. Uh, the president of the center wanted to have a quick word. Barbara, I hope you don't mind. I actually was uh, impressed uh, with consensus on the panel about one rather important issue, or at least an implicit consensus. So there is no military option. I think that this is important to establish. If everybody on this panel believes that there is no military option, that is a very important conclusion. I, I don't believe that, Dmitry. <laughs> Good try, Dmitry. I mean, I, I, I didn't say anything about it, uh, and it, it seems quite clear to me that this administration is not going to take military action. Um, but the Israelis are another matter. And it seems to me uh, that uh, they will face a moment, can't tell you when, uh, when the evidence is overwhelming that they have a last opportunity to impede the nuclear weapons program. In 1981, when the Israelis destroyed the Osiric reactor, it wasn't because it was on the verge of producing a nuclear weapon or even nuclear material in any quantity. It was triggered uh, by something quite different, by the fact that fuel was about to be loaded into a reactor, and once the fuel was there, uh, it could only be attacked with uh, uh, collateral damage that was politically and morally unacceptable. So uh, if they didn't act before the fuel went in, they would lose the option to act forever. There will be some trigger, maybe not quite as black and white as that, that the Israelis will be monitoring very closely. And if and when they arrive at that point, and uh, the, uh, um, the opposition have not brought down the regime in Iran, I, I hope that's the better solution. Uh, or sanctions have not uh, helped to trigger uh, a collapse of the regime, uh, then I think they will take action. And I think they, uh, uh, they're investing a lot of money and time and energy in uh, preparing themselves to do that. They're training constantly. They're developing new weapons for that, uh, that purpose. And uh, we all hope it's unnecessary. But I believe they're capable of setting the program back sufficiently so that if you believe that it is the threat the Israelis believe, it is the, the least bad option. Barbara. And do identify yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara Slavin. Uh, two questions. Flint, uh, Jeff Kemp has said there's no way Obama is going to do a Nixon to China with Iran. What makes you continue to think that this Iranian government is really interested in negotiations and an agreement with the United States, uh, given its domestic political problems, uh, the fact that this Current, this Brazilian-Turkish agreement is already being criticized by Iranians to the right of Ahmadinejad as well as to the left. And, and to, to Richard Pearl, um, given the sorry history of U.S. involvement in regime change efforts in Iran and other countries, Iraq I would mention as well, why should the United States overtly support the opposition movement in Iran. Uh, how would that help them? Wouldn't it really uh, undercut them? And uh, uh, are you proposing to find a, a Chalabi for Iran? Thank you. <laughs> Flint, I guess you got the first question. Okay. Yeah. I mean, for, he's on the next panel. For, for, for those of you who, who, who don't know, Barbara and I have very different readings of Iranian domestic politics. Um, I, I don't think the 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 Iranian government is all that constrained on fundamental strategic issues by um, what's happened 
you know, surrounding the election last June and and subsequently. Um, you know, it's, it's become this kind of mantra among Iran analysts in the United States that the system is too divided to have a coherent strategy or to take important decisions. Well, they have pursued a coherent strategy on the TRR. They have gotten this Brazilian-Turkish mediated deal, and when push came to shove, they took the critical decision to accept it. Um, now, why do I think they're, they're interested in this? Um, they say they're interested in it, up to and including the, the supreme leader. You know, who, who continues, I mean, they're not interested in it at any price. They're not interested in it at what they would consider, you know, a surrender of their sovereignty on important subjects. But, you know, the Supreme Leader has, has said very directly, both in the 2009 Nauru speech and again in the 2010 Nauru speech, you know, if the United States wants to change its policies, we will change too. And, um, they just don't think they've seen evidence of change in, in U.S. policy. Um, the TRR deal, I can't imagine it would have gone through if the Supreme Leader had not given his approval. Um, you know, I don't think, huh? It hasn't really gone through yet. Well, um, I think for the kinds of public announcements that we saw in Tehran, on, on Sunday and Monday to, to take place. Um, I would take that as a sign that the, the leader signed off on, on that. So, you know, I think they will be able to go through with the, with the TRR deal, um, whether the U.S. willing to, to, uh, to go through it, it's another matter, but I think the Iranians would be in a position to do it, and I, just, I, just, I don't see them as domestically constrained on um, important foreign policy issues. Uh, I, I agree with that. I think the, uh, the regime is perfectly capable of acting in a cohesive way, of designing and implementing a strategy. Indeed, they do it rather better than we do. Um, the question is, how long will that regime be there? And it's why I believe in regime change, because as long as it's there, I think it will continue to, uh, to outmaneuver us and move closer to its, uh, its objective. But Barbara, there are lots of ways to change regimes. And uh, in Iraq, we changed the regime uh, with the Army and the Marines and the Navy and the Air Force because we hadn't succeeded in changing the regime or even attempting to do so by political means. But you look around the world and there are plenty of places where we've changed regimes by political means. Uh, Marcos in the Philippines, uh, uh, Franco in Spain, uh, we did it in Portugal, we did it, I, I say we did it. Uh, it, it was, those regime changes were a consequence of political action and very frequently support for in, internal opponents. Uh, look at the collapse of, uh, of uh, the Soviet Union, or at least the, the empire. So uh, regime changes uh, uh, can be accomplished in many ways, and what I'm proposing is that we do it, or attempt to do it, politically by recognizing that, that there, there is a very substantial, highly motivated uh, opposition that is now compelled uh, to work without any support from outside. And if you look at the other successful regime changes, there was support from outside. It's damn difficult to do it entirely with one's uh, internal resources. So I hope we don't get to the point where the only means of changing the regime is, uh, is military. Fritz, you were next on the list. I've got, uh, just so you know, I've got Fritz, uh, Ted Katu, Ray Tanter, Sam Lewis, Joe Klein, Noam Bailey. Uh, uh, we'll Richard, see if question, we can get through it. Question for you, because you'll understand the uses and abuses of uh, Cold War analogies, probably the best of panel members. Um, as we learned at great cost uh, in money, time, uh, you don't become a real nuclear power until you get a survivable retaliatory force that can withstand massive attack, including with nuclear weapons. Um, <clears throat> this means that uh, when Iran gets its hands on a few uh, nuclear weapons, 
uh, it's still years and years away from a survivable force and might not be able to get there unless we tolerate it and it gets outside technological help because the deployment options of the Cold War era are not available in the era of Google Earth and Zero CEP. What this means is, to use the Cold War analogy template, you know, you've got, a re you've got a regime of Iran's character in terms of its elite makeup, its temperament, the people at the top, with its pernicious uh, relationships, ambitions, and behaviors in the region, and a nuclear weapons capability in diapers, so to speak, which it can only use in a first strike or through covert delivery. By Cold War standards, it's impossible to imagine a more dangerous player. Now, has anybody factored that reality into the calculation of the necessity and the options for stopping what that player is doing? By the way, that was Fritz Ehrmarth. I'm identifying him for himself. Please identify yourselves when I call on you. Does anybody in the panel want to respond to Fritz? Yeah, okay, Fritz. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, I mean, first of all, I would, I mean, I, I want to address your question, but before I do, I want to say I actually take issue with the with the premise of it, and here I, I, I would dissent from Richard Pearl's statement that all of us here agree that Iran is um, trying to build nuclear weapons. Um, I don't believe Iran is trying to build nuclear weapons. I believe Iran is trying to achieve a nuclear option, meaning that it would be perceived as having the major building blocks for fabricating nuclear weapons at some point in the future, including um, a significant degree of mastery of the fuel cycle, but I have seen no evidence that they have taken a concerted decision as a system to go all the way toward weaponization. In fact, I think the evidence points in the other way, that they are basically pushing the envelope of their of the NPT to lay the groundwork for this nuclear option. And so I don't, I, I have trouble with the assumption that, oh yes, if only they can, they are going to fabricate, um, fabricate nuclear weapons. Um, I think that is at, at, at best an, an unproven and untested uh, assumption. Um, I also, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, very easy to make facile assumptions about the mindset of the people in charge of the Islamic Republic. But I mean, if you actually look at their, you know, the historical record of Iranian foreign policy since, particularly since Ayatollah Khomeini died, um, I think it, this is a system which basically thinks about its foreign policy in terms of material national interests. This is a country that has no um, significant ability to project conventional military power beyond its borders. I think that's a really important reality to, to grasp. And I think that they want this nuclear option as a kind of last ditch deterrent. They see, you know, they have 15 neighboring states. Not one of them is a natural ally. Several of them have been used as platforms for hostile actions against the Islamic Republic. And they think they have some major security problems to, to deal with. I mean, unless you have, I think it would be a warped view of Shia Islam and this supposed millenary tendency in Shia Islam that the Islamic Republic as a system is prepared to make Iran the first suicide nation in history. I think the idea of nuclear first use by the Islamic Republic is really fanciful. Uh, David. Yeah, I'm beginning to feel like Joe Biden during the political campaign, so let me respond to <laughs> the primary campaign. Um, let me, Fritz, I think you raise an interesting point which provides one of the unexplored areas of dialogue with the Iranians. 
I don't think they've thought through the issue of what does it mean if we were to go ahead and have a deployed one. Um, just as the Indians and the Pakistanis did not understand it until afterwards. Or, and you know the history better than I did, the dialogue with the Soviets about what were the real elements of stability and understanding that dynamics, which was part of the dialogue between the two countries in the 60s and the 70s. I think, in fact, right now, and it may not be the United States that needs to hold this discussion, but we should certainly encourage the Indians and Pakistanis and even the Chinese to discuss with the Iranians what happens if you go ahead, what you have to have, and the dangers of a small nuclear force to yourself, not just to others. And I mean, I, unfortunately, it's difficult for the American administration to do it because we've said there's a red line and we won't let you cross that red line. I mean, that damn desert's the pink desert. So many red lines have been crossed. And so to enter in those discussions with the Iranians opens an American administration to your accepting Iran having a nuclear program. Someone needs to start engaging Iran with the real implications if they were to go there. And let me just say with on one point of Flint's, Look, I don't know anyone who knows for sure whether the Iranians are seeking nuclear weapons as a means to another end or they're really seeking nuclear weapons because they're down to determine. I don't think there's any, that's, a, that's an unknown unknown right now. We just don't know that. So you can't make a, a policy based on one or the other. And that's part of the, the damn difficulty of making a coherent policy uh, with the Iranians right now. They're, they're proceeding as if they were, maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but you can't wait till you know that. And so, I mean, I, I think that's one of the, and one final thing about something Richard said, because it really disturbs me and it's dangerous for American policy, uh, particularly in the UN. It's facile to say uh, medical iso nuclear medical isotopes, that's like Chinese, uh, California, marijuana. Look, Richard, there, that reactor was supplied to the Iranians by the U.S. government. It's had international inspectors in it twice a year at least, and more recently. The reactor does need to be refueled. Um, if you don't believe radionuclear isotopes are important, I invite you to go and talk to any number of doctors in the U.S. We are currently facing a shortage of radionuclear isotopes for medical purposes in the United States because we stopped our reactors that were producing it. And guess what happened? The Canadians who we were depending on closed both of their reactors. And so there is a real scramble now. And this is a serious issue. And if we dismiss it and treat it, trivialize it as a stratagem, it, that's going to poison others in the UN system and on the Security Council who know about that issue. And so, I mean, there is a tendency, and I'm certainly not defending the Iranian regime, but this was a simple technical issue that they needed to, and it's getting caught up in politics. And if you dismiss it, you're really opening uh, the U.S. to serious, more serious problems than it already has uh, in the U.N. and coming to terms uh, with the Iranian program and uh, trying to stop it. I'm uh, going to close off the, uh, the list, and what I'm going to do, because I've been told that uh, my instructions are to end this a little bit earlier, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Ambassador Ted Katouf, Ray Tanter, and Sam Lewis to ask their questions in a bunch. We'll get responses to those, and then we'll take the last two sets of questions and get responses to those. So, over to you, Ted. Yes, my uh, question is for Richard Pearl. Uh, if by some miracle we could get an embargo on refined uh, oil products, petroleum products to Iran. Um, the regime is unlikely, I believe, to just allow itself to be strangled. Like Henry Kissinger once said famously during the Arab oil embargo, if somebody has their thumbs on your windpipe, you know, something to the effect that you, you act forcibly to save yourself. So could you, as a, as a long time national security strategists play out a scenario in which, you know, briefly, and how Iran would probably 
respond in the Gulf in terms of maybe trying to stop oil from getting out of the Gulf, using Hezbollah, making mischief in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the like. Ray Tanter, up here. We're going to do three questions in a row. Ray, Tan Ray Tanter, Georgetown University. Hi. On one hand, I think Richard Pearl has made a good point about putting regime change on the table because it says to the Iranian regime that there are costs to pay for the various kinds of actions it's taking. On the other hand, I don't think it's necessary to, for the United States to give overt support or even covert support. All the United States has to do is to take the National Council of Resistance of Iran and the Mujahideen of Khalq off the U.S. Foreign Terrorist Organizations list, consequence of which would allow for immigrants across the, around the world to, blend, to provide leadership to the Iranian street. The United States could take a hands-off policy thereafter and get out of Iranian politics. So I think regime change ought to be on the table, but it should not be directed in any way by the U.S. government. And since this is question. supposed to be a question, do a you question. agree? <laughs> um, Ambassador Sam Lewis is next. And, no, you're in the next batch. I haven't forgotten you, don't worry. Um, I think uh, Dimitri started the question that I was going to ask. I, I think Richard is right in stressing the Israeli dilemma I haven't heard very much about. Uh, whether or not it's rational, it is seen as something that is very existential that could happen, and it's hard to swallow that if you've got numbers on your arms, as many Israelis do. My question is this. Let's suppose for a moment that everything else has failed over the next two couple of years, and the Israelis do become convinced that it's not just getting the, getting the equipment ready to produce a weapon, but in fact they're in the process of producing it. And that's not too hard to imagine. And the question really is, what would the United States President do, or what could he do, to stop them if he became convinced they were going? I'm not sure they'll ask us, but I think you would know it was about to happen if we're smart. What would any of you, any of you, think he could do or would do to stop them in that eventuality? Two of the questions were to you, Richard, so why don't you go first? Um, you, you started to enumerate some of the things Iran might do if it. Uh, if it were subjected to the shock of an even substantially, not completely effective, uh, embargo on petroleum product. And one could add to the list. Um, the calculation, in my view, and not everyone would agree with this approach to that particular sanction, mm -hmm. but the calculation, in, uh, in, in my view, is that uh, if you deliver a, uh, a shock of that magnitude, things happen very quickly. And, uh, and either the regime uh, collapses uh, or it doesn't. I think there's a decent chance it, it would collapse. I mean, we <clears throat> you remember what it was like when, uh, when you had to queue for an hour to get gasoline in the United States. Imagine if, uh, uh, if this. So I, I, I think a shock to the system would play out very quickly. And uh, it, it's true the Iranians could. Uh, attempt to cut off uh, the flow of oil, but that would also cut off their revenue. Uh, that's, that's, that's not obvious, and it's not obvious that they could achieve it. Uh, you don't close the straits as easily as some people, uh, some people have suggested. Could they unleash uh, uh, captive terrorist organizations? Uh, sure, they've done that before. Uh, and will probably do it again, and by the way, are likely to do it uh, to a fairly well if they ever believe that they're protected by a nuclear weapon. So uh, yeah, you have to take into account there would be reactions. Um, on the um, um, I, I'm sorry, the, the well, Israelis uh, on what the Israelis. Uh, 
well, I think. To, how to deal with it, really, was the right. question. Well, I, I would hope, uh, Sam, that if we became persuaded that the Israelis were about to act, whatever we thought of the wisdom of that, uh, we would consider that the worst of all possible outcomes would be a failed Israeli action. And we would therefore uh, uh, do what we could to see that it didn't fail. I mean, I think you can change policy very quickly in a situation like that. You know, you didn't want it to happen, but now it's going to happen. And suddenly you recalibrate, or at least I hope you recalibrate. Uh, um, and uh, in, in that event, I think we might, uh, um, we might reconsider whether our opposition carried forward would be helpful or harmful. I just, w one very brief thing, I, I wanted to respond to something uh, that Flint said. It seemed to me in, in the space of two sentences, um, um, he offered us a, a kind of glaring contradiction. Uh, he said on the one hand that uh, Iran's interest in a nuclear weapon was unproven and untested, and that's right. Um, and then he said, but of course what the Iranians want is a deterrent. Uh, that strongly implies that the objective is exactly what remains unproven and untested. And it does seem to me that it's very difficult to explain Iran's missile program, except in the context of a, uh, of a nuclear program. You don't build $50 million missiles to deliver 800 pounds of TNT. Of course, we are. Uh, anybody else in the panel want to respond to Sam Lewis's question? Um, Jeffrey. Sam, I think, uh, you know, a lot would depend upon the what else is going on in that scenario. I mean, it, it seems to me that, that um, any president would have to take into account, A, what our vulnerabilities are in the region. Do we still have troops in Iraq? Do we still have, are we still very vulnerable in Afghanistan? What is, this, what is the, what the economy looking like? I mean, could, this, uh, could a, a strike sort of tip us into a recession? I mean, it seems to me all these things would have to be taken into account. And, but nevertheless, I mean, um, the implication of what Richard said was that nevertheless, if indeed it's clear the Israelis are going ahead, then um, he suggests that we would have to make sure they do not fail, which to me means we would have to help them. And there's all sorts of ways we can help them without directly uh, going in ourselves. But I, I think that would be, um, that would really be a very tough call for any president. Okay, uh, uh, next was Joe. Hi, uh, Joe Klein from Time Magazine. First, um, there was a fair amount of dismissiveness about the, uh, the sanctions regime uh, at the United Nations. Got a little bit of news. As we've been sitting here uh, this afternoon, the U.S. government has distributed to every member of the Security Council the, the agreement, the detailed agreement that the Chinese and Russians signed along with us. Uh, on what the sanction regime should be, uh, which I do not think is insignificant uh, given what happened with the Iranians, the Turks, and the Brazilians yesterday. The fact that the Russians and Chinese were willing to come along with that. And so, Dov, you were saying no one's here to defend the administration. I'm here to defend at least that. Um, and secondly, apologies to David and Jeffrey, but you've been saying reasonable things. I'd like to follow on. Uh, Barbara's questions um, to, uh, to Flint and Richard. Um, in the middle of Tehran, as you know, Flint, there is a building that is called the Museum of the Great Satan. It used to be called the United States Embassy. And on the, front, on the walls, there is all kinds of official graffiti. And my favorite one says, on the day the Great Satan praises us, we shall mourn. And it seems to me, as I've covered this story, been to Iran several times, watched it from a distance, that that's been pretty much the policy of the government. They need us to be the great Satan in order to maintain their power in the country. And I, I just, I, I, I don't understand how you can take the position that you take about their willingness to negotiate with us when I've seen absolutely no evidence of it. 
from the, from the time of Khatami refusing to shake Bill Clinton's hand at the United Nations in 2000 to the first six months before the June 12 elections when the Iranians made absolutely no effort to negotiate with us. And furthermore, I'll tell you that in the week before the election, I interviewed every leading member of the Iranian reform movement and not one of them were willing to even talk about negotiations on the nuclear program with the exception of Mousavi, who said, I think that the president's gesture in Cairo admitting to the CIA coup was an important move and we should proceed from there. The rest of them had no interest. And so I don't understand where you're coming from and what information you have on, on what basis you think that they're going to um, negotiate with us when they really need us to act as an enemy in order to survive. Richard, um, my question for you is this. My sense of the people out in the streets, it's not more my sense, it's based on dozens and dozens and dozens of interviews, is that every last one of those people who are opposing the government were also aware of the following fact, that of the one million casualties in the Iran-Iraq war, 100,000 were chemical victims of the war, and every last person I talked to in Iran believes that the United States provided those chemical weapons or their precursors to Iraq. So there's a certain amount of sensitivity when it comes to outside assistance. Uh, I put assistance in quotes. And second of all, if you want those people to rebel against that government, why on earth would you want to hurt them with, you know, extended gasoline lines. Wouldn't that even further turn them against us and reaffirm the notion that the great Satan is our enemy? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Norm Bailey is going to have the last question. I would point out, Joe, that while you supported the administration's policy, my point was simply that none of the four speakers did. And I don't think anybody disagrees with me. It was just an observation. Norm, Norm I've heard of you and I've uh, always Norm wanted Bailey. to meet you. Um, now somebody said it to you. Um, Norman Bailey, Institute of World Politics. Um, this administration is certainly not going to attack Iran militarily. As a matter of fact, I believe they have already decided that they can live with a nuclear Iran and intend to do so. I can't imagine any rational Israeli government attacking Iran's nuclear facilities, which are heavily hardened. Uh, if I were running the Israeli government, I would attack uh, the uh, soft targets. I would cause Iran to, to stop to existing as a functioning society. I'm talking about oil facilities, uh, uh, electric uh, uh, production facilities, ports, airports, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And let the various ethnic minorities in Iran, which all together incidentally are a majority, and all of which hate the Persians, uh, cause Iran to fall apart as a country. All right. Uh I don't and care I'll take you, a commission, uh, BB, if you want to take it. Um, I don't care which you guys wants to go first. <laughs> You've had some interesting questions put to you. Um, let, let me respond to, to Joe Klein's question. I'm, I mean, I have a long answer about the, the history of the last 20 years of U.S.-Iranian relations and why I believe that there's a you know, steady stream of evidence that the Iranians have been interested in a strategic opening to the United States. But let me just take the, the, the period you discussed in some detail, the, the six months leading up to um, the, the June 12, 2009 presidential election. I mean, what, what occurred in that period was that Obama was inaugurated. He made some initial rhetorical statements that were well received in Tehran. Um, he was prepared to address the country by its official name, for example. Um, and then he issued in March his first Nauru's message. Roughly 48 hours later, the Supreme Leader responded in his annual Nauru speech in Mashhad. And I thought this at the time, but Iranian officials have told me that this was the correct read. That that speech was really important because what does the leader say in that speech? He goes through the litany of all the bad things that the United States has done to Iran over the years. But then he says, 
We have no experience with this administration. This is a new American administration. And President Obama says he wants to change. Well, fine. If you change your policies towards us, we will change too. Now, Iranian officials have told me that that formulation was very, very deliberate. It didn't say, here are the three things you have to do, you have to change to show you're serious. Because maybe Obama couldn't do one of those things. Or maybe if he did, he'd get hammered domestically for surrendering to Iranian demands. So instead, the leader says, you want to show you're serious, you're going to change U.S. policy toward us, and we'll kind of leave it up to you to define what that means. We will change too. And from an Iranian perspective, from that time on, there was no substantive change in American policy toward the Islamic Republic. And activities that had the U.S. had been carrying on under the previous administration, including U.S. support for, um, for groups carrying out um, activities meant to destabilize the Islamic Republic, those activities continued after Obama took office. By way of comparison, I would note one of the first things that Nixon did when he took office in January 69 was to tell the CIA to stand down from covert operations in Tibet because he wanted to signal the Chinese that he was serious. The Iranians were looking for a signal that Obama really meant it. From their perspective, they have never received it. It does not surprise me at all that none of the opposition candidates other than Museveni would tell you that they were prepared to negotiate on the nuclear issue. I think it helps to explain why Museveni lost the election. Um, I think also, um, given the way the nuclear issue had, had worked out, you know, Hatami had actually suspended enrichment in Iran for the better part of two years and is widely considered in Iran, even by his supporters, to have gotten nothing for that. And so, why would anyone with any kind of serious electoral ambitions in Iran, you know, step up to the plate a week before the election and say, oh yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to suspend, I'm going to do these things to encourage. Yeah, but it's, you know, it, this election was taking place in an atmosphere in which the previous administration's handling of the nuclear issue is widely considered even by reformists to have been um, a failure from an Iranian point of view. Um, okay. Richard? Um, you know, I, I think there are Just on tactics and strategy involved, and I think Joe is right about, uh, about the strategy. Uh, they need us as, uh, as the uh, canonical enemy in order to uh, retain power. And the rest is maneuver. And they're rather better at it than I have. And they take in our officials all the time. And they even take in policy analysts from time to time. Why would a petroleum embargo produce uh, uh, sympathy for the United States? I think you can get to the, I can't prove this, of course, but I think you can get to the point where uh, people say, this regime is so badly handled uh, itself that we are now being victimized even by the outside world. I, I remember um, two presidential campaigns, the last one and the one before that, in which uh, an appeal was made to the American voter that because we had become unpopular abroad, we should change our administration. Regime change because we had spoiled things with our friends and our allies. It's the same phenomenon. And it more or less worked. Uh, people came to the conclusion that we were responsible for the disapprobation of others. If you add to that uh, the, uh, the sort of immediate shock effect of uh, grinding the country to a halt or close to a halt, it's a gamble. It's a gamble whether uh, people take to the streets uh, to replace the regime. It's easier to do that than find petrol. And I, I can't be sure that, that that would happen. But it seems to me it's uh, 
preferable to the alternatives. The alternatives are Iran becomes a nuclear weapon state with all that uh, entails, or on the verge of it becoming a nuclear weapon state, the Israelis resort to military action. And when you look at those as uh, the, the, the options that uh, we, we might face, uh, something like an embargo on refined petroleum product looks a lot less risky. We are just about out of time. I want to give our other two panelists a chance to say, make a quick final comment. Well, I'll be very quick, Joe. I, what I thought we had agreement on up here was that san this fourth round of sanctions would not change the policy of the Iranian government with regard to the nuclear weapons program. Although I would, I would also add, maybe I'll, we ought to have a side bet for a drink. Filing the resolution does not ensure that there will be a vote on the resolution anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And the new dynamic, if the, if the Perm 5 were to press for a vote right now prior to negotiations on the Turkish-Brazilian-Iranian program, mm -hmm. you would have, I mean, you might be able to do it, but boy, the consequence would be horrendous that I don't think anyone would responsibly do it. So, I mean, I actually think we have two trains that just happened to pass. My personal advice would not have been, if asked, would not have been today, the day after the meeting with the Turks, Brazilians, and the Iranians, to circulate the resolution. I think that's going to be seen as a slap in the face of those who are not the Perm 5. But, you know, they didn't ask. It. Jeff, last word. <laughs> I've been trying to think through what the United States would have to get from the Iranian regime for rapprochement to be politically acceptable here at home. And it, it goes much beyond the ending the nuclear weapons program. It would require the recognition of Israel, the end of military support for Hamas and Hezbollah, and to end into direct interference with, with Iraq and Afghanistan. I simply do not see the regime in Tehran um, accepting those terms. Uh, I just can't believe they would do that. So therefore my prognosis for the next uh, year or so is there will be no rapprochement. There will probably be no use of force either. There will be no overt Iranian bomb, but they will continue with the getting the wherewithals at some point to get one. And that what you will see is a steady improvement in the U.S. military to military relationships with key countries like Israel and the Arab Gulf. And I think that's that's where it's going to go. Well, I want to thank our panelists. This is not a discussion that has ended, but it's ended for now. Uh, thank you, all of you, for your excellent contributions and for your questions. Thank you. <laughs>